Hello, and welcome to the Genomics and Health Equity RFAs pre-application webinar. My name is Lucia Hindorf. I'm a program director in the Training, Diversity, and Health Equity, or TIDE, office at the NHGRI. Um, I want to welcome you to this webinar on behalf of my colleagues um, at the NHGRI who are representing the review and the grants administration branches, as well as program directors from four other institute centers and offices at the NIH. A few housekeeping rules before we get into the meat of the RFAs. I wanted to note that this is a Zoom webinar, and as such, the chat will be disabled for the participants. However, if you have questions at any time, you can enter them in the Q&A feature in the, the toolbar of Zoom. We will also, um, when it comes time to the Q&A session of the chat, if you would like to verbally speak, we'll allow the option to raise your hand and then we can call on you and enable your sound as well. Otherwise, the video and sound for all of the participants will be turned off. Um, I also wanna note that NHGRI will be archiving this recording and updating Q&As on the website that was in the notice for the webinar so that if you have colleagues who weren't able to make it or if you want to refer back to this webinar or the, um, the FAQs that will be available after, um, after this webinar is over. Okay, so I think we're ready to get started. And let me review our agenda for this webinar. I'll start by giving a purpose of the RFAs as well as the summary of the funding opportunities, the two funding opportunities um, that, that are the focus of this webinar. And then I will present an overview of the IC specific research interests of the participating, um, our participating collaborators, as well as summarizing additional application information and then important dates. And then um, my other ICO colleagues will join me for the Q&A if there are specific questions um, that they should be addressing. So that's just a brief overview of how we'll spend our time today. Um, so just to dive into the purpose. So um, NHGRI was really excited to partner with um, our other uh, collaborators at NIH to be supporting R01 and R21 investigator initiated research in genomics and health equity. And for us, this includes developing approaches, generating and disseminating data, and implementing metrics or interventions in order to advance the equitable use of genomics to improve health in all U.S. populations. We want to note that this is a fairly broad opportunity. We want to encourage research that spans the scientific missions or areas of interest to NHGRI, um, NIA, NCI, ORWH, um, and the All of Us Research Program. So I'll start by just presenting a very brief overview of um, what we're defining health equity as and how we're sort of looking at that from a genomics lens. So this is a definition of health equity from the CDC, and it's, it's when every person has the opportunity to attain their full health potential and no one is disadvantaged from achieving this potential because of social position or other socially determined circumstances. And as we think about health equity research, we also want to um, encourage that inclusion of populations or communities experiencing health disparities uh, is encouraged in your research plans. Uh, the proposed research must go beyond simple inclusion of uh, disadvantaged or health disparity populations and address a health equity research question. And we'll get into what examples of some of those research questions might be. Um, I also want to note, we, because we have gotten a couple of inquiries, the health equity impact should apply to U.S. populations um, for applications that are going to be submitted to this RFA. Uh, we do allow foreign applications as well as foreign components, but we uh, wrote the RFAs so that the focus would be on um, health of U.S. populations at large. I want to note that there are two different RFAs that support two different activity codes, the R01 and the R21. Um, many of you are likely familiar with this idea of investigator initiated research projects, which are kind of the, um, the research um, grants that NIH supports. And these are grants that represent an investigator specific interest in competencies and are relevant to the stated program interests of participating NIH institute centers or offices. So the examples that we lift in the list in the RFA are really just um, broad examples. And the idea is that the um, 
idea for the research design and the research plan comes from you, the investigators. So the two different RFAs that we're supporting are the R01, which ends in 017, and these are intended for uh, research with that are based research that's based on mature scientific ideas with preliminary data. And then we are also supporting an R21 RFA that's more for exploratory and developmental research. And if you have questions about how your research might fit into one or um, one or um, either of these activity codes, please reach out to a program director and we can walk you through this. Okay, so that's just the general RFAs. And then I do want to spend some time talking about the IC specific interests since um, there are a number of different ways that uh, each of each of our ICOs are thinking about genomics and health equity. So at the NHGRI, um, we are thinking about health equity very broadly. We're thinking about it beyond kind of health outcomes, which is um, how a lot of health equity research, I think, has been um, thought about and funded to date. So at NHGRI, we are also interested in access to high quality and comprehensive genomic information. So a lot of this falls under the biology of um, the biology of genomes or biology of disease areas of NHGI's portfolio. Uh, we're talking about maximizing the utility of genomic social and environmental data to address health disparities. Um, we're talking about addressing challenges to genomic data sharing or data science that could impact health equity. Um, and then we're also including integrating genomic data with fine scale data across multiple dimensions. So lots of different omics or precision environmental health um, to better characterize health disparities. So these are just examples I wanna note and all of these slides that I'm going through are just examples. And please do, uh, I encourage you to reach out to a program director at the specific um, Institute Center or office if you have questions. Um, NHGRI is also interested in development of accessible technology and methods, um, especially those that are uh, appropriate for under-resourced laboratories and clinics. I'm sorry, I need to move my Zoom bar here. Um, we're interested in a genomic technology or testing, um, as well as quality of management or of genomic testing results. So we do support a lot of genomic medicine research, and I think in a health equity framework, this includes um, research related to how race or other socially defined descriptors can be distinguished from genomic information when you're talking about laboratory reference values and clinical algorithms. Um, and then we also are encouraging studies around decision science, economic or healthcare utilization around technologies or genomic testing that uh, does affect how uh, allocation of clinical resources um, occurs and how that could be made more equitable. Um, and then finally, the, the last um, area is acceptability of genomic approaches and interventions to the public. This kind of work often falls uh, within our ethical, legal, and social implications or LC portfolio. Um, the examples we have here are developing and applying metrics of health equity and genomic research that are acceptable and useful to communities, participants, and researchers and identifying and overcoming barriers that limit participation in and benefit from genomic research um, to, to the public and to the broad U.S. population. Okay, so the next um, institute that I will be overviewing is the National Cancer Institute. They are interested in supporting discovery, utilization, and translation of genome genetic information um, as it relates to the prevention, detection, and treatment of cancer across diverse populations. And this can be done through a number of ways, including integrated analysis of diverse populations through holistic approaches, such as system modeling, studies of cancer types that are rare or disproportionately affect the understudied populations, novel recruitment efforts in underrepresented populations, and partnership with national and global programs and consortia. And CI is also encouraging the leveraging or enhancing um, resources that, that NCI supports and investments related to, um, I'm not going to read through uh, all the examples, but uh, just the kind of broad category. So these resources include uh, I, those identifying and recruiting cancer cases, um, incorporating data through linkages to existing databases with relevant exposure, administrative and health related data, community engagement, and cost-effective exposure assessment and genomic profiling. So there's a lot of really good um, useful resources here and we'll make sure these are available to you all um, in the slides and they're also in the RFA. Okay, our partners at the National Institute on Aging or NIA are interested in applications that focus on aging research as well as Alzheimer's disease and related dementia, studies drawing from data across the lifespan, applic applications um, um, are encouraged to ex uh, ex 
are expected to factor sex as a biological variable into research. And then um, they've also provided some information on their strategic directions for research, as well as examples of research milestones. So I encourage you to look at um, those documents as well. Our colleagues at the All of Us Research Program are interested in supporting our 21 applications focused on understanding how social determinants of health influence genomic variations between and with within human genetic ancestry groups, how it contributes to unequal burden of disease risk, development, risk, um, disability, severity, and progression across, sorry, across populations historically underrepresented in biomedical research. Um, they wanted to point out that unresponsive applications include those that only address differences in genomic variations and biological processes across populations without addressing social determinants of health in the study design. And then um, this schematic, I think, is helpful in understanding um, the un underrepresented biomedical research categories that the All of Us Research Program uses. Um, I won't read through them all, but they're they're very holistic, and I encourage you to um, to read more about this if your application is going to be using All of Us Research data. Um, so applications are also encouraged from all uh, for all of us that use community engaged research approaches to inform the research study and promoting data justice. Um, those will be prioritized by uh, the all of us program team. So if you're proposing to use all of us data, investigators must register for the researcher workbench and then complete uh, the data access process. And there's a, a link here and uh, will be available to you. And then please note that additional training is required to access the all of us controlled tier. And again, more information can be found at this link here. Okay, our colleagues from um, the Office of Research and Women's Health um, do not accept primary assignments, but they will be working with the other ICs to identify potential co-funding for meritorious applications. Um, if you do have specific questions or your application is related to women's health, um, we encourage you to reach out um, as well. Okay, so that concludes the um, different um, ICO interests in this RFA. So hopefully that gives you a better sense of um, the the range and um, the breadth of the support for genomics and health equity that we have across the NIH. I'm going to go into some additional application information, just some practical details um, as you prepare your applications. So first of all, um, this information is all in the RFAs, but if you're planning on submitting an R01 application, please note that there is a limit of um, up to 500,000 in direct costs per year. Uh, there is a, a slight difference in the number of years that are supported depending on which institute will support um, your application. So for NHGRI, NIA, and uh, ORWH applications, it's a maximum of four years, and then it's a maximum of five years, five years for NCI applications. And this is where I really strongly encourage, um, especially if you're uh, planning on submitting an application that's related to cancer or anything NCI is interested in, please reach out to both uh, myself um, and Melissa Rotuno, who's the contact um, listed in the RFA. If you're interested in submitting an R21, please note that your a budget limit will be up to $200,000 in direct costs per year for a maximum of two, a two-year project period. Okay, um, one new-ish facet of this RFA, at least for NHGRI, is that we are requiring for both R01 and R21 applications a plan for enhancing diverse perspectives. Um, this is an, a new um, component that um, other initiatives at NIH, uh, notably the BRAIN initiative, have been pioneering. And what this is, is basically a one-page addition to your application that describes how you will advance the scientific and technical merit of the proposed project through inclusivity. And the um, PEDP guidance material that we linked to in the RFA it shows examples of possible strategies. These should be tailored to your research aims. And so, you know, I can't give you, for example, a checklist of things that you should or shouldn't include. Um, and I should also notice that there's obviously going to be a difference in scope between R01 and R21 research. And so the PEDP would be tailored accordingly, uh, uh, accordingly to the scope of that research. So I just want to walk through a examples of possible strategies that you might want to consider. Again, these are not requirements, but these are just examples of what we mean by strategies that would help support the research aim. So they could include um, transdisciplinary research projects and collaborations among researchers from different disciplines. Uh, it can include engagement from different types of institutions and organizations, so institutional diversity, um, applications of partnerships that enhance geographic and regional heterogeneity, 
Um, it could include investigators and teams that are composed of researchers at different career stages. Um, and then the participation um, of individuals from diverse backgrounds, including diverse, uh, including groups traditionally underrepresented in the biomedical behavior and clinical research workforce. Um, and then uh, uh, the final example that we have here is opportunities to enhance the research environment to benefit early and mid-career investigators. And so the idea here is that um, enhancing diverse perspectives is something that the NIH believes to, uh, contributes to creative and dynamic and innovative research, and, and that is something that um, that we value in supporting our investigator-initiated research as well. So this is just a, a way for um, you, the investigators, to share with us ideas and strategies that you have to enhance diverse perspectives as you conduct your research. I also want to point out for... Um, the data man management and sharing plan, there is overall uh, broad NIH guidance. Um, NHGRI in the past couple years has released its own guidance um, that I think in a sort of top top line um, summary, uh, we support the broadest appropriate data sharing with timely data released through widely accessible data repositories. Um, if you're generating or using data, these will be um, important considerations for you to, to address as well. So feel free to follow up with me or any of the other program directors if you have questions about um, what a da data management and sharing plan component means or how it might apply to your application. Okay, so um, we're almost to the end here of the, the overview part. Um, the important dates I just want to um, run by all of you. I think we're looking at the, the next dates here. So if you're planning on submitting an application, we would appreciate a letter of intent by October 9th. Um, it's not required um, and it's not binding. So if you send one in, you're not obliged to submit an application. And also if you are still deciding and you don't send a letter of intent and by October 9th, you still are allowed to um, submit an application, but we do encourage them because it helps us plan for kind of our review workload. The deadline that you do all need to meet if you're planning to apply for this cycle is November 8th, 2023. So that's our first deadline. And then we will have successive deadlines in July of next year, uh, 2024, and then July um, of 2025 as well. Okay, so um, we've now come to the question and answer portion of the webinar. We have uh, a couple of questions that were submitted already that I will get. I will start off first, but um, while I'm doing that, if you have additional questions, um, pl please feel free to put them in the um, question and answer period. Um, um, component of Zoom. And then also, if it is easier for you to raise your hand and speak, um, please go ahead and do that, and then we can um, we can enable that as well. Okay. Um, first of all, let me actually just see if there are any comments from my other NIH colleagues who are on Zoom here, if they want to sort of clarify anything I said or add to anything I said before we get to Q&A. Nothing from me, Lucia. Okay. I'm not seeing any hands or chat, so maybe we're okay to um, proceed. Um, so the first pre-submitted question I'm going to answer is, what understanding of health equity is being employed in the context of this funding announcement? So I hope in working through some of the examples and the definitions of health equity um, in the webinar, we've gotten a little bit at that. So I will say, I think our understanding is fairly broad. Um, and so we want to make sure that as you're putting together your applications, um, you're running um, by program directors what ideas you have. It always helps us for you to um, send a, a draft of your specific aims. Um, a couple of applicants I've talked to, um, I think have, I've encouraged them to broaden beyond just looking at a specific underrepresented population. So a, a couple of people have asked, here's a, a research question I want to address, you know, and it's in a specific um, underrepresented population. And that's great. And we want to encourage that. But um, we also want to encourage this broader view of how is that research going to uh, in, in Prove health equity, however you're defining in your research for all populations. So there's an there's an aspect of sort of how can that research that you're doing be um, be uh, bear on health equity more broadly in the U.S. population. So if you have additional clarifications that you'd like, um, please feel to type them in chat. But um, I'm hope I'm hoping that's going to help um, address that um, question. So the second question is. Is funding available to for-profit commercial organizations? Are CRADA's a requirement? 
Um, and I'm going to ask uh, Mar Marcella, Marcella Trujillo from NHGRI Grants Administration Branch to address that, please. Yeah, hi, thanks, Lucia. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes? Okay, great. So both of the, the notices indicate that for-profit organizations can apply, and there's no indication of um, CREDA being a requirement. So it appears that they can apply individually without you know, an agreement, without a CREDA agreement. Hope that answers your question. If not, you're welcome to send any you know, admin questions to, if it's specific to my institute in HDRI, send it to me, um, or otherwise to the you know, admin contact for the um, particular institute that you're going to apply through. Thank you. Thanks, Marcella. Okay, I'm gonna turn to the questions and answers. I'm just gonna go through them in order here. I think we, we, we have um, six so far. So um, the first one is, do you support creating a minority cohort registry? Um, so I'm going to answer on behalf of the NHGRI here. I, th I think the answer might be similar, but um, NHGRI uh, is looking for investigator-initiated research. And so the creation of just a, you know, a minority cohort registry alone probably would not be supported. It would need to be connected to some sort of research question that, that deals with health equity. Um, and I, you know, again, I would encourage you to reach out to me um, or if, you know, if, if, if the cohort might be of interest to some of my other NIH colleagues, reach out to, to multiple of us um, with kind of your, your draft aims um, and how the registry fits into a research question that's related to genomics and health equity. Okay, so um, the second question, uh, was this webinar recorded and how might we access the slide deck later? Uh, yes. So this webinar is being recorded and we will have a link to the webinar um, as well as we'll be updating the, the Q&As based on your questions and answers. Um, there is a web page that was in the notice um, the uh, the notice that described this pre-application webinar and how you register. So that page will will have all of the updated information, um, and it will give us give us like a, at least a week or so to, or to some number of days to get all of this um, up on the um, up on the website. But yeah, we do plan to update it and make it available. Sorry, not not update the webinar, make the webinar um, available and update the questions. Okay, um, is the letter of intent due in October? even if we plan to submit in 2024. Um, so I'm sorry if I caused confusion about this. If you're planning on submitting for the 2024 dates, the letter of intent is due 30 days before the date. So there's the, the letter of intents go with the receipt dates. So um, you'll have a later um, a letter of intent date if you plan to submit in 2024. Okay, thank you, Leah, for putting the link for the application webinar, the notice in there in the chat for everyone. Okay, um, let's see. I think we answered, somebody else asked about the slides or video recording available for future reference. We answered that one already. Okay, next question. Would genomics or multi-omic sample sizes in African ancestry populations around 200 be competitive, e.g. as a test set for models built in um, AOU? Um, uh, Janeth Sanchez, my uh, colleague from the All of Us Research Program is on. Janeth, do you wanna um, take that one? Yes, uh, for this uh, notice of uh, funding opportunities, we are specifically looking at um, applications that use all of this research program, um, looking at social determinants and how they contribute to different outcomes. Um, specifically to the population sizes, we will uh, encourage uh, investigators to apply appropriate methods uh, for small populations. Um, but really, it, it comes down to the research questions uh, specifically, and, and I would encourage you to, to navigate the researcher workbench to look at, at those uh, numbers as well, of those populations. Thanks, Jeanette. And I think it's probably worth mentioning again that um, the All of Us Research Program is signed on to the R21, but not the R01 um, RFA. So I think that kind of also tells you a little bit about the scope of the research that they'll be supporting. Okay. Um, there's a question, is there a preference of the type of institutions that the researcher should be affiliated with, basic research, clinical research, NGO, governmental, or private? Um, so we actually don't have a preference. We do have a list of eligible institutions that can be supported. It's quite broad. Um, so that I think is really the um, place I would direct you to. Um, I'm not aware that we would restrict 
any of these. Um, so the, the main, I think, restriction I want to mention is that we, um, no, I'm sorry. We do support for, uh, we don't support foreign applications, but we do support, uh, foreign components of applications. Sorry. That's what I meant to say earlier in the webinar. Um, so yeah, I think if you have additional questions on that, please let me know, but we, we do support a broad range of, um, eligible institutions. Okay. I'm not seeing any open questions. Um, Gerald, are there any hands? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands either. Oh, and you know what? Actually, more questions have come in. Okay. Um, it is not clear what is unique in this RFA compared with the previous efforts of minority and genomics research supported by NHGI. Okay, so um, this is you know something you know, we are interested in. It's, you're right. It's not necessarily a novel area of research. It's an area of research that we would like to emphasize more. Um, NHGI in particular has funded... Um, research in the area of health disparities um, and minority and genomics research. We have a long history of funding this, as, as do other institutes and centers and offices at the NIH. But what we would really like to do is um, lead the way in convening a group of investigators to address things that are specific to genomics and health equity. So I think, you know, we kind of want to go beyond um, looking at just individual health disparity populations and um, kind of create more of a portfolio that's more at the leading edge of genomics and health equity. So um, thanks for your question. Okay, um, next question is underrepresented workforce, PI or co-I in the team a necessity for this RFA? No, we we encourage everyone to apply, um, in, in, including um, PIs who are from underrepresented populations, but it's not an, it's not a requirement. Okay. Um, is there a preference for retrospective versus prospective studies with new recruitment? Um, I, I would say this probably depends on your research question, maybe a little bit, which institute might be supporting your research. It's, it's really hard to answer this question. Just it's, it's very broad. Um, you know, I, I will say, um, some of the applicants I've been talking to, I think, um, you know, you do have to consider if you're going to be generating new data or recruiting new participants. We do have um, budget limits that you know are kind of the uh, up to 500k for the R01 and up to 200k for the R21. So that might end up being a factor. Um, but again, I would encourage you to reach out to a program director um, and and maybe get get um, the institute center offices take on this. Um, Okay, uh, the the question about creating a minority cohort registry. Yeah, so I, I think it it needs to be the minority cohort registry would need to be part of a research question in genomics and health equity. I think we would need to sort of see how how the aims um, were structured around the creation of this registry and what research questions it would answer and how it would answer a genomics and health equity research question. So sorry, it's it's a little bit of a vague answer, but it, I would encourage you to reach out to a program director um, and talk to us more about your idea. Um, okay. Our program officers want to communicate via email or call to make sure that, ide yes, ideas are aligned. Yes, yes. We, we encourage that. We've um, been fielding calls and emails from applicants already, so please don't hesitate to reach out. If it looks like your research might be relevant to more than one um, institute center office, feel free to, to email, you know, multiple of us. Or um, if you want to email me, um, I've also been looping in um, other program directors as well if I, if I think they might be interested. Okay, um, question, if I want to study cancer-related disparities, should I reach out to you or some other PO from NCI? So I think um, I would encourage you to reach out to my colleague, Melissa Rituno, who is the contact in the RFA. Melissa was un unable to make it. So today uh, we have a Leah Mechanic from the NCI. Um, Leah, do you want to, I'm sorry, I didn't answer this. Okay, do you want to answer the um, the question? Um, yes, thanks, Lucia. Yes, uh, please uh, go ahead and uh, email Melissa Rotuno, but copy uh, Lucia Hindhorf on that email so that uh, we have tracking uh, uh, across the uh, initiative of what is coming in. Um, and I just want to note that NCI is, is only uh, participating in the R01 uh, RFA, uh, correct? Thanks for that reminder. Okay. 
I don't see any hands. Okay, we have a partial question. Um, is NCI only supporting R01s? Yeah, I think Le uh, Leah just answered that. Just R01s for NCI. Um, we haven't. Okay, Leah, maybe you can put Le Melissa's contact in the chat. That would be great. Um, do we, do you support training minority type grant? Um, I'm going to try and maybe. Um, answer this from a very high perspective. I, I think if you're referring to a training grant that's basically providing opportunities for research to a range of individuals in the context of their their research training, no, these are not training grants. These are research grants um, that address investigator-initiated research. So um, hopefully that answers your question. If you have questions about how training or students might fit into the context of a research grant, um, feel free to reach out and, and we can talk about your specific idea. I'm sorry, I'm like not keeping up with the answering here. Okay. So any other questions? Okay, no matter what research area we choose to research, can we still choose NHGRI as IC? So I would encourage I would encourage you to reach out to me. I think if it looks like there's not a clear um, home for your research area, I would encourage you to reach out to me. Um, I think the assignments um, are done by are done centrally. Um, chances are, it, if it doesn't fall clearly within the other um, ICOs, it will probably get assigned to NHGRI. But I, you know, again, I would encourage you to reach out to me. We can discuss your research program your research idea. Will there be a special emphasis panel to review for this RFA? Um, I guess my simple answer is yes. And I will see if Rudy Pazzotti from our uh, review branch at NHGRI has anything to add to this. Sure, just that we'll look at the applications that have come in for review and the kind of reviewer, the expertise of the review panel will be determined by what's proposed in the applications. Thank you, Rudy. Okay, are there any other questions? So Lucia, let me just clarify. I think the SEP panel will be by IC, meaning NHGRI, not by CSR. Am I correct? Correct. Yes. Rudy was um, was responding on behalf of the NHGRI review branch. So, the, yeah, it'll be convened at NHGRI. Hopefully that's clear. Okay. Um, I think if people... Oh, here's another question coming in. Okay. Do you support grants related to health disparities in low and middle income countries? Okay, so I think this is a tricky one. Um, I did mention that the RFA was written to support research that will be relevant to the health of U.S. populations. I think we'll want to talk about the idea that you have for your application in terms of how the um, the research in the low, low and middle income countries um, relates to the goals of the RFA. So I think that's what I would encourage um, you to do. I don't know if any, any of my other colleagues from... Um, other ICs have anything to add to that? Okay, I hope that helps. Okay, I'm seeing the questions are slowing down. Um, if you do have additional questions, again, please don't hesitate to reach out um, to myself or any of my colleagues at the NIH. Um, we will make this webinar and we'll update the Q&As um, on the webpage that was in the chat. And again, um, we really appreciate all the interest in this RFA so far. We look forward to talking with you about your applications um, and thank you for your interest um, in genomics and health equity. So I think we'll go ahead and um, end the webinar now and please don't hesitate to be in touch. Thank you all. <laughs>